Welcome to Local Everywhere. I'm Cynthia Pooler. My guest today is Assemblywoman Pat Fahey. And Pat has a, a sad but inspiring story to tell. Please start from the beginning. Um, first of all, thank you for having me. I very much appreciate it. Yes, I'm the <sighs> assembly member for the Albany uh, district uh, here in the 109th, uh, what's called the capital seat, and so proud to represent you and so many others. Um, so COVID turned everyone's lives upside down in March of 2020. My son was doing gig work, uh, just slowly making it as a uh, a filmmaker, uh, doing, doing part-time work, had just moved to New York City a year and a half before, after graduating Ithaca College. COVID immediately knocked him out of work as New York City was essentially completely mm. shut down. And uh, that was hard enough <clears throat> uh, in March of 2020 to see him suddenly, you know, his his uh, work life fall apart. Uh, in June of 2020, um, he started to run again, started to kind of just come to grips with a few things of what was going on and experienced chest pains. The next thing we know, uh, a girlfriend, thank God, uh, brought him into the ER and a very sharp uh, ER doctor caught immediately uh, that there were tumors on his chest and lungs. Wow. So for his 24th birthday on June 22nd, 2020, uh, he had a biopsy and we tried to joke at the time, uh, not realizing just how we knew it was bad. But uh, we joked, I said, okay, Brendan, what other kids can say you're legally having fentanyl on your 24th birthday? Wow. As he was in for surgery and they brought him a cupcake. The nurses were wonderful at Albany Med. Um, long, long story. Uh, we thought he went through very, very intensive chemo all summer and fall uh, uh, and was getting ready for surgery to get the rest of it out of his lungs. And uh, it was right next to his heart. It's, it's called mediastinal germ cell uh cancer. It's very similar to testicular cancer, but because it was not in the testicles, it was in his chest and lungs. Um, it was, it is considered an extremely rare cancer. So just as he was getting ready after uh, eight different rounds of chemo, oh. um, it was uh, the end of September, it was found in his brain in 2020. So oh, the surgery, he then had three stem cell transplants um, more, more intensive chemo and brain radiation. Again, uh, got ready for surgery. Surgery was done in February of 2021 and it was considered extremely intensive, but successful. Uh, and he was, um, put in, uh, diagnosed as being in remission, uh, March, sorry, April of 2021, two months later, I'm afraid the cancer came back with a vengeance. Oh boy. Uh, and by then um, uh, we struggled to get it under control in the summer of 2021 and uh, tried again. Uh, uh, but by then it was, uh, by the fall, it was spreading to a few other places that went back into his brain twice. So countless more rounds of, he had eight different regimens or eight lines of chemo in the end, eight different treatments of chemo. Uh, countless, countless radiation as we were trying to get it from the hip, his back, his spleen, his brain, his, um, anyway, uh, we were very anxious for a, a study uh, to get him enrolled in a uh, clinical trial. And um, his health was really failing by that point. And uh, in February, uh, February 28th of this year, uh, 2022, we lost him. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it, because the lungs, it really just began to overtake the lungs again and uh, couldn't keep his oxygen up. And uh, it happened all very fast in the end. So, so we you, 20, 20 months, bottom line is 20 months. So you continued to represent Albany. Yes, uh, we were back and forth to New York. My husband and I were back and forth to New York City, especially once it returned in April of 2021. I was mostly down there, uh, constantly going back and forth, but his treatment was down at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering mm -hmm. uh, for most of those, most of that 20 month battle. So, it, you know, to say it had to be difficult. 
that's an understatement, right? It, um, it's, um, we are still shattered. We're completely shattered over it. Um, uh, he was my oldest and my only son. Um, and uh, he was a skinny runner, <laughs> healthiest kid walking. Um, so uh, to say that it came out of nowhere, it will remain forever the shock of our lives. Mm -hmm. as it was the shock of our lives. Um, I will unfortunately go to my grave not knowing what happened because we don't know what happened or what caused it. Um, uh, you know, some, when you read about some experts, some say cancer is in all of us, what causes it to mutate? That haunts me. What, what caused it to mutate? Did, this, did the stress of life, did the stress of COVID? Who, who knows? But we, we will never know. Um, uh, again, 95% of testicular type or germ cell cancers are curable because his was unusual. Um, and because it, it, it started in the chest and was in both lungs by the time it was found. Um, he had an uphill battle from the beginning, but we, we thought he had kicked it. We thought he had kicked it in February 2021 and only for it to come back. So, so it, it, yes, work, work in some ways, I guess, because I had to keep focusing on work. I have a wonderful team here, small, but wonderful team that helped keep me going and uh, help, help make sure we still represented the 109th John McDonald helped stepped in constantly because I gavel three days a week. Uh, John McDonald stepped in so many times as did my team. Um, and in the end, uh, as I said, we just, um, we couldn't save him. Uh, he, had, he had good care at Sloan Kettering uh, and at Albany Med. And I'm, I'm very grateful. I, I think they were personally touched as well that it didn't work. Was this the same cancer that Brian Piccolo had? Uh, yes, I think it. I think it was. I have to look that up. It was a, but but I think his was the more traditional testicular cancer. It it is it is a very similar cancer to what Lance Armstrong had the right. the, the um uh, the cyclist. Yeah, the uh and um, but his was the more traditional. Even though his cancer went to his brain as well by the time it was found, he recovered and is still is still going strong. Uh, but since since Brian Piccolo, which was the early 1970s, um, I think he was the Chicago Bears player, football player. Um, in those days, uh, this type of cancer had no cure rate. It was only in the later 70s that they found the um, the mix of chemotherapy that was given to Brendan, by the way. Very similar chemotherapy from 50 years ago was used again on Brendan, but they'd had a lot more success. Brendan's was just very rare and the odds were, um, we didn't know how much they were against him. If you want to know the truth, we worked hard every day to keep flipping the coin. I would, I read once the opposite of fear is hope. So I would say to my son all the time, we have to keep flipping the coin because fear paralyzes us. Right. It does paralyze us in so many areas of our lives. So we, we desperately tried to stay on the side of hope and Everything was thrown at him, everything, and he wanted to live. So he was he was a model patient. They they adored him. Obviously, he's he was a gifted person. This is very hard for me. Thank I'm you. So sorry. No, Cindy, I um I so appreciate I so appreciate your um it, the other night when we launched this photo book that was put together uh, this past fall, I found myself, it was like another wake all over again. Um, just the outpouring of support was very emotional. Um, and yes, I had a lot of tears last Thursday when we launched the Brendan Fahey Beckett photography book. Uh, I'm so, so by the I'm, I'm sorry, Pat. So he, he obviously knew that the odds were against them, right? Yes, he did. Uh, and there were times, uh, to be perfectly frank, uh, he would get extremely despondent. He was sick most of those 20 months because he was he was virtually never without chemotherapy. One time he was doing immunotherapy. But the two months that he was in remission was the only time he wasn't on some form of chemo. So he was 
incredibly sick. Um, and even when the two months he was in remission, he was recovering from a sternotomy. I hope I said it right. He had a huge scar down his entire chest from when they tried to get it out in February, 2021. Um, so yes, he was he was always sick. And, and my job in many ways was to, as was my husband's, his sister, his girlfriend, was to just keep him going and, um, you know, get him, as we say, to put one foot in front of the other. So, um, but he wanted to live. So he was willing to do anything that was asked of him. We would go in by 2021, by that summer, he was going in every single day to Sloan Kettering, often on the weekends too, to get uh, fluids just to help with the nausea, blood work, often radiation, um, di countless different tests that he was constantly signed up for. So cancer was a, a full-time job for most of those 20 months. Uh, it was it was a full-time job. And, and because he couldn't work, and after the cancer came back, we really urged him to, uh, as well, a wonderful integrative medicine doctor also urged him to try to find some meaning and meaning in life. So he picked up the uh, camera. He, he'd always loved cinematography, but he picked up his camera again and began to take some photos, uh, mostly in that 2021 by June uh, through the end of the year, when we'd get him out for sometimes 10 minute walks if he wasn't feeling well, other times a little longer. Um, quite frankly, we were always pushing him to just get up and just keep walking. We'd make him walk between one building of MSK or Sloan Kettering and another building. They were about a half mile apart unless he was really, really ill or when the cancer went to his hip, you know, when it became very painful. We always, we pushed him hard to, um, to keep walking. And those photos then became his outlet and it was <laughs> wonderful when he'd be sitting at his instead of in bed. So I knew three local photographers and I forgot I even said this to them, but at Brendan's funeral, I said, uh, I knew they had published a book of black and white photos. Um, it was a book uh, of photos by Agnes Zellen and Mark, uh, sorry, Paul Tick. And the photographic curator was Mark Kelly. So the three of them, they all live here in the town of Bethlehem. They live locally. And I've known them, but what they've done is uh, put together this extraordinarily professional book of less than 40 photos. Brendan had hundreds upon hundreds, but only 40 made the cut. They were very particular um, and only wanted his exceptional work. And they put together this small, but incredibly powerful photo of um, what is what is it, what they insisted would be an art book, not a cancer journey. So what kind of pictures did he like to take? He, Brendan did not like people in his photos. He was that way even in high school when he would do more photography and then in early college. He liked scenery and he liked the ordinary. One of my favorite, he, he made the ordinary somewhat extraordinary in my view. Um, this is Coney Island. So it's a picture of the parachute um, in Coney Island, but Brendan looked through some rafters and took a picture of the parachute jump. Um, there's another one that I just, there's, this is a bicycle with flowers. We're big bike people. And uh -huh. stopped, uh, that was on a walk, uh, walking uh, on the Upper East Side between the two where the one Sloan Kettering building was to another, going back to the parking lot to get our, our car. Um, so he, he just, this is Tivoli, this is the Tivoli Preserve. Um, and it's where they, it's the basin where they catch water, overflow water. So he he had a an eye for the ordinary and made it, in my view, rather extraordinary. This, we're big cyclists again. Uh -huh. Up in the Adirondacks on a short walk. I didn't even know he had take. Well, I guess I saw him take this, mm -hmm. but it says no bicycles. And if you mm -hmm. see those are bullet holes. 
Mm -hmm. uh, that's right up in the Adirondacks near Scroon mm -hmm. uh, Lake. And I just thought it's so perfect if you think about it. It says so much. Mm -hmm. um, a, a no bicycle sign with bullet holes in it. Um, and right here in the Adirondacks. So he he loved the ordinary, loved scenes of nature, but loved just capturing street signs. And in this this case, a bicycle sign. Art, art to me is very important yes. because an artist sees things that maybe somebody else might not might overlook yes. and when you see what they did it gives you a new perspective right cynthia i've learned the hard way the hard way brendan always had an artistic side to him and i've learned the hard way how art can heal and it can what i say soothe our souls and when we would see him when i would just see him take out the camera a couple of, we were often we'd carry everything for him again because it was enough that we'd get him to walk and when uh, one time I just handed it to him because I was weighed down with a number of his bags coming back from the hospital and walking back and uh and next thing I know he takes out the camera it, my heart would just lift I'll be honest because I knew then he could get his mind off the cancer because we were fighting cancer full time and just take that that break and look at the world. And he so often came up with some of the quirkiest, fascinating photos and things that I didn't notice, a one-way sign, um, a building looking upward, a different angle than you would normally, odd angles that you wouldn't normally look at, like the Coney Island parachute. Right. And um, yes, I think it became his creative outlet, but it was a healing outlet to help get um, his mind off of the cancer and when I'd see him at his desktop editing some of those it meant he wasn't in bed just feeling nauseous and sick mm -hmm. sitting mm -hmm. on the couch it was uh, I, I think it gave him a little bit of a motivation in the end as, uh, especially in the summer of 2021 it was a very bad summer because we struggled to get the cancer under control that summer a number of different interventions were failing Finally, by the middle of August, we were getting it a little more under control. And um, so, yes, art, I, so uh, uh, all of the proceeds from this book, my husband and I have underwritten all the costs of the um, production of it. So um, all the proceeds are now going right back into the arts community for really targeting young artists, whether in film, um, visual arts, creative uh, um, uh, performance arts, uh, it will be the Albany Center Gallery. We're going to do a, a little um, honorarium in his name, uh, the uh, Opalka Gallery, where an event mm -hmm. was hosted. So we're going to sponsor various scholarships. We've already sponsored two scholarships at Albany High for college for students going on to the creative arts in uh, college, whether music or arts. Um, so we we want to pay it forward. We can never thank all the people, all the outpouring of support that helped us. So it's our way of paying it forward with numerous, the Irish American Museum is going to do a film fest in his name. Um, the uh, New York State International Film Festival, we're gonna give an award in his name next year. So we're we're just, trying to do small but significant things that will help honor and recognize young artists. Now, how, how long did your son have an interest in photography? Well, it started with film. And I remember when he picked up a broken film camera we had. He was the shyest, of, shyest and gentlest of children. And he was in middle school and I can remember him out in the yard filming his sister and the next door neighbor. And then somehow we, we let him use the one we had and he started to make some films. So this started in middle school. I saw the interest and I also immediately recognized that for a shy kid, it was easier to go behind the camera. He mm -hmm. never wanted to be in front of it. So, it, you know, it was his way of relating to the world. And he went to a uh, we got him in a two-week part-day program at Proctor's Theater, 
um, in uh, the summer of middle school. So, um, oh my, in like 2010 or something, uh, 2010 or maybe earlier. And that really began to flourish. Uh, and Mike Ferns Fernstein um, uh, still teaches a course there as best I know, but, but really then by high school, really began by senior year of high school, any teacher that would ask him for a paper on anything, he would turn into a film project. So really like the writing part, but the teachers, it was a, he had a math assignment. He turned that into a film project. So even when it was a math assignment, he was turning it into film projects. So his brain just went on fire his senior year of high school. How did he do that? How did he accomplish a, a math project turning it into a film project? They took a, um, uh, oh my gosh, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna have to look up my, my husband would know it's a, it's a theory, it's a film, um, I think it's called Theory, uh, but he took a really famous uh, Radiohead song, they put the words of this um, math theory and, and for a calculus class and turned, took the Radiohead song and made it all about this calculus class. And oh, wow with a bunch of kids we actually my husband noted it in the obituary Brendan was really a math science child who had a creative side I used to call him my little renaissance man so when he would do films or he would you know do uh photography did you take a look at it and say oh my god I never realized that or I I didn't realize it from that perspective absolutely Absolutely. And when he was doing films, especially in high school, so many of them were about Vietnam uh, and World War II. And uh, um, he was truly inspired by a book, and I'm going to forget the author's name, but it's a, it's a famous uh, Vietnam book called The Things They Carried. And he did a number of films. And I think it was also his way of trying to sort out violence in the world, mm -hmm. uh, and trying to come to grips with violence and war. He was very, he is, one of his first memories was at age five when 9-11 happened. And he would play 9-11 as a firefighter trying to save people out of the towers. He, he played it with his sister and next door neighbor for, for ages actually. So I, mm -hmm. think, I think he was always trying to sort out, a film became an outlet to sort out some things in his head too with violence and war that were troubling to him. Mm -hmm. So in college, what did he major in? Well, the, the, the short story is he started at RPI, uh, really following the engineering slash physics track because he was, he had a math science brain, but he was very unhappy there. And so I said, Brendan, you can always go back and be an engineer. You can go back and do the, I said, just let's, let's just give the arts a try. So we started the whole application process again. We were very late in it, uh, but by sophomore year, he switched to Ithaca College for film. Mm -hmm. so his degree ended up being cinematography and um, cinematography and photography, I think. But, uh, but film was his first love, but the camera still loved the camera. And again, when he couldn't work for his last two years, uh, the, the uh, taking photography really then began to replace that so he used photography with with mathematics that's amazing well and I think his career was just starting it's very hard to be a gig worker to you know he moved to New York not really knowing anyone but trying to get jobs he was just starting a year and a half in where he was getting these jobs and I think one of the reasons he would get these camera assistant jobs is because he had that he was so good on the technical side because he had such a technical mathematical brain. And so we, we did get lovely feedback from a few people who worked with him um, and uh, where he was the, the either the first assistant camera on music videos and things of that nature or the um, uh, director of photography on, on mm -hmm. smaller films. He was just, he got to work on a commercial for... Uh, ax sorry, on Axios, which he got to fly to Iowa and met Kamala uh, Kamala Harris as mm -hmm. she was running for president. He got to meet 
Michael Bloomberg when he was filming commercials when he was running for president. He mm-hmm. got to be on a jump team going up to New Hampshire for a Trump rally, which scared me, quite frankly. Mm-hmm. Um, but so he was just starting to get recognized for his reliability and his, I, I think, some of his technical side. Mm. And, and, and then COVID, everything went right out the window mm-hmm. and, then cancer, mm-hmm. and then cancer hit. So COVID. Then- See, it must have been very difficult to cope with COVID as well as a life-threatening disease. Yes. How did he and how did you work through that? We're still working through it. Um, and it was not easy. Uh, COVID, as you know, I, I think the biggest single result other than the deaths and the trauma it has created, we're still feeling the effects of the isolation of it. And so mm-hmm. many people, including young people, were just isolated in their bedrooms with a computer screen. And that's just not healthy. So I was, we always tried to say, no matter what, we've got to get outside, get outside. And and I remember reading so much at the time about how nature heals, nature heals. So even if he lived right by Central Park, so even if it was only a few minutes, we'd always try to say, just find any excuse, get out for 10 minutes. Now, often that didn't happen, but just as often it did. And um, uh, that was really important. He also had uh, a lovely girlfriend in the beginning and then uh, another newer one after uh, after the cancer came back. So he had some um, he had some lovely people. He had a best friend, Musa Kane. Uh, he ended up being his best man at his wedding not long before Brendan died. Um, it was a childhood friend who would call him every night. And uh, so, but it was, but make no mistake, the illness was compounded by the isolation, by the tremendous, tremendous isolation of COVID. And, you know, when even restaurants were shut down for a while, it mm-hmm. just added to the isolation. So mm-hmm. it, it was, it's multiple layers of trauma and uh, and it remained multiple layers. The, one of the hardest times was when he was at the hospital in Albany Med and then in Sloan in the very beginning and then at Sloan Kettering and when no one could spend the night and when the visiting hours were only four hours that would that would really take a massive toll on him when somebody couldn't be there overnight with him Mm -hmm. Um, so when the cancer came back in April 2021 again he lived about eight more months uh we promised him he'd never spend a moment alone and he didn't. Wow. So tell us a little bit about who will benefit from the book. Yeah. So we, um, so a number of organizations, well, one, we're just hoping to get art out there and show that art, um, art matters. Uh, uh, again, uh, Mark Kelly was insistent to me that it not be a cancer journey. And at some point, maybe we do something about his cancer journey um, because we have photos of him getting chemo and photos of you know, how he looked during chemo. And um, uh, but we um, uh, but the book is really going to be an art book. And again, all the proceeds are going to go to places like the Albany Center Gallery the New York State International Film Festival, the Irish American Museum, a film festival they are doing. By the way, one is launching on Sunday there. Uh, the uh, I, I have a list somewhere, the Opalka Gallery. We're just mm-hmm. going to do small grants uh, to the degree we can. We hope to go down to Sloan Kettering and give a small donation to their integrative medicine uh, that meant so much. Mm -hmm. Uh, When Brendan, a couple of times he was inpatient hospitalized and they had a woman come in to play the guitar when there weren't COVID restrictions. Mm -hmm. So those kind of things really help a patient. Uh, So again, what we're trying to do is take our trauma and we can never really go back and thank all the people that did help him. Mm -hmm. Some we don't even know. So all like the only thing we can think to do is just get this out there and pay it forward to, to others in hopes that it helps a young, a young budding photographer or cinematographer. So if somebody wants to purchase your book or learn more about your book, how could they reach you? 
it's um uh there's a website uh bfb fund so it's brendan fahey beckett bfbfund.com okay or if you just look up brendan fahey beckett book um but if it bfb were his initials so one word bfb fund okay uh dot com okay terrific sorry yeah. i pulled that up if uh if you need me to but sure uh, sure um yeah it's b f b fund it's all one word and that's the uh that is the um i don't know if that comes up okay yeah that's good up a little bit more that's perfect okay great that's, great and again it's for the photographs of brendan fahey beckett so if you just uh if you just look at that okay Pam, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank uh, you. I wish you the best of luck. Thank you. It, uh -huh. it's been a, this has helped um, to, to kind of focus some of our energy and focus some of our grief. Uh, so, and, and then just trying to, it's a way of thanking people. So that helps too, when you can focus on others. So it's, it's been a part of the healing process. Mm -hmm. And it allows us to keep his memory alive. I, I know he was such a gentle, shy kid. It would have meant a lot to him. So so thank you so much for the interest. I really am for your flexibility and scheduling. So one, one, one thing, um, I read in the paper that the, uh, were the lines redrawn? Are you still in the city or do you represent outside the city of Albany? The lines, uh, so I now under the current lines that kick in January 1st, I'm going okay. to have all the city of Albany plus most of Gilderland and the town of New Scotland. Oh, yes. wow. Yes. But however, the new legislative redistricting committee commission just proposed new lines yet again. Oh, God. Uh, they will not be final. Uh, what, uh, they will not be final until April, but and we have many more months of work on this. But those lines are different yet again. They keep me in the city of Albany completely, so I'll still be city of Albany. Mm -hmm. But then uh, this time they take me out of Gilderland, out of New Scotland, where I've always represented, put me back into Bethlehem, where I represented for my first 10 years, and then also add in the city of Rensselaer across the river. So, so to be continued is the bottom line, but it looks like either way, I will remain uh, representing all of the city of Albany, but John McDonald has assured me he will continue to be of assistance and he will evolve Troy, so we'll continue to coordinate. But Roy, the, the, the redistricting process this time has been unbelievable. It's almost, it's a little embarrassing and I think it turns off the voters quite frankly. So I mm. think we can settle this down. I'm going to work with whatever whatever I'm given, but we do need to settle this down because it's confusing and disillusioning to the voters. I, I'm going to make it work. Uh, I, I'd love to continue to hang on. I love the 109th district. I'd love to hang on to as, as much of it as I can, mm -hmm. but I'm going to make it work and, um, and uh, continue to work hard. One can one aside from the conversation that we have had was what do you envision for the legislative session coming up in January? It's going to be busy. It's never not busy, but um, the challenges, there's just more and more challenges all the time. I see housing, uh, housing that's one uh, really um a downside of what another downside of what's happened with COVID, uh, housing, uh, we're not growing the pie, you know, so we have housing shortages everywhere around this country, let alone here in New York. Uh, I, we've uh, so we still have to grapple with increasing the amount of available, especially affordable housing. So we've got to get construction going, we've got to get renovations going, we've got to deal with evictions. Um, and stabilize the, the housing market. So housing, I think is going to be a big one. Healthcare, we're doing a press event uh, with John McDonald on Wednesday. Um, the healthcare, the, the serious, serious funding 
uh, problems as well as a massive turnover in workforce. So I think healthcare is going to be huge. Housing is going to be huge. Uh, the environment, of course, we've gotten some good news with the latest vote of, of, of the environmental bond, but that's always challenging because it is the existential threat. Um, uh, and uh, education, I think you saw the regents may want to do away with the the right. Regions. I read that. Yeah, so I think there's there's going to be a lot. Uh, we've got to continue with our infrastructure um, investments as well. Uh, so there's, there, I know I'm missing a oh criminal justice. Uh, we know from the election, uh, public safety matters. Uh, I um, I am solidly supportive of my votes on bail reform, but I know that there's areas where we can tighten up, including youth with guns. We have got to tighten up mm. on youth uh, with guns, as well as more in more areas on domestic violence. Um, so, so there's a couple of areas where we can tighten up there, and we need to continue to be as aggressive as we can be with getting guns off the street. So, so that that is just going to continue to be an issue. And I do think there's areas we can tighten up while still respecting the um, <clears throat> the gist of, of of what we have adopted, and that is removing the pocketbook out of the bail system. So you're, in other words, your level of justice is not dictated by your, uh, the size of your pocketbook. So we can, we can abide by the, the over, the philosophical parts of bail reform, yet tighten up where need be, especially with youth and guns, domestic violence and related issues. It has been such a pleasure talking with you. Thank You've you. been listening to Assemblywoman Patricia Fahey. I'm Cynthia Pooler. This is Local Everywhere. And please, if you like what our conversation, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Pat, we shall be talking again at some point. Have a great day. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you. All right.